She saw four men coming toward our house, and all of them had torches, lighted torches on their side, coming straight to our house. Some African-American communities are prospering, like the residents of Greenwood. When the planes would fly over, we would see them dropping something to the rooftops of the different houses and set in them on fire. They walked right past the bed, right straight to the curtains. And they set fire to the curtains. I'm sorry, my friend, because God's got the key and you can't get in. Thomas Jefferson made America a promise when he penned its Declaration of Independence in 1776. We hold these truths to be self-evident. All men and women created by the go, you know the you know the thing. Between 1862 and 1865, 750,000 Americans died fighting for these rights in the US Civil War. And on December 6th, 1865, the 13th Amendment was ratified to abolish slavery in the United States. In reaction, the South began to enact Jim Crow laws, mandated separate but equal segregation. In many ways, the Jim Crow era in the United States was worse on black people, with Confederate states no longer having an incentive to keep black people healthy and happy for the sake of production. Segregation is that which is forced upon inferiors by superiors. Separation is done voluntarily by two equals. During the Civil War, Oklahoma was still Indian territory, land that the native tribes were forced onto by way of the Trail of Tears. But no one gets in the way of manifest destiny, so they were shooed down the road again, making way for the 1889 Oklahoma land run. A Black Friday-style foot race for stolen lands, and some people actually cheated starting early. Strangely, they are revered by some to this day for their shady ways. After gaining official statehood in 1907, Oklahoma's first piece of legislation written into law was one of these Jim Crow laws, banning interracial marriage and black citizens from frequenting white businesses, although they could work at them. And this is really where the story of Black Wall Street begins, in Tulsa, Oklahoma. In response, a small black community called Greenwood said, fine, fuck y'all, and signed a covenant stating that you must be black to own property in Greenwood. They put a strong emphasis on their currency, only shopping at black owned businesses in their community. While Jim Crow was busy raping black communities all across the Southern US, Greenwood flipped the script and used those prejudiced laws to empower their own people and their community prospered tremendously. Black Wall Street was born. There were 10,000 black residents and 600 black owned businesses in Greenwood. They had an elementary school and a high school which quickly became some of the best in the city. They had a library, a hospital, churches, doctors, lawyers, engineers. Greenwood even had indoor plumbing before most of Tulsa. The community could meet its every need from within. And this is why there was 15 black millionaires living in Greenwood at the time, just 50 years after slavery had been abolished. But the mood of the nation was shifting and trouble was coming. When America entered World War I in 1917, there was 350,000 black soldiers among the ranks. And they fought side by side with their white brother albeit mostly in support roles. Meanwhile, at the time, the mentality of the white people in America was that black men would rape their wives and daughters due largely to homegrown propaganda like the birth of a nation, originally called the Klansmen. So when black veterans returned home to be treated like second-class citizens by draft dodgers and ignorant assholes, a flame was sparked. And during the red summer of 1919, race riots broke out across the U.S., including Washington, D.C., and St. Louis, just to name a few. And for two more years, Greenwood continued to prosper. But on May 30th, 1921, an interaction between a black man and a white woman in an elevator 
would start a domino effect that would lead to 36 city blocks of Greenwood being burnt and 9,000 of the 10,000 black residents left homeless. May 30th, which happened to also be Memorial Day. The black veterans of Tulsa had petitioned to take part in the city parade, but were turned away like they had been for the last several years, elevating the animosity in the black community. But back to the two people in the elevator. Diamond Dick Rowland, whose birth name was Jimmy Jones, was adopted. While at Booker T High School, he changed his last name to Roland out of respect for his adopted family, and Dick, well, probably because he was slanging it. He played basketball and football at Booker T, and he did well in school, before dropping out to start making a living, shining shoes in downtown Tulsa. By all accounts, he was a handsome guy who was good with the ladies. Even less is known about Sarah Page, a 15 to 17 year old white girl who some say was new to town, moving from Kansas after a divorce, but we know for sure that she was an elevator attendant in the Drexel Tower downtown, which Dick Rowland would frequent to use the segregated bathrooms on the third floor. And on May 31st, Dick did just this. But what happens next is only speculation, because neither Dick or Sarah were interviewed about the events, and both were lost to time shortly after. Some say Dick had fallen sweet on Sarah during their fleeting interactions, and decided to make a pass at her that day, which she didn't appreciate. But others say he simply tripped on the uneven elevator landing and grabbed her arm to catch himself. There are even some who believe that the two were already a secret couple, merely having a lover's quarrel. In any case, when the elevator doors opened on the first floor, Sarah was hitting him wildly with her purse, and he took off on foot as she yelled, He assaulted me! Diamond Dick Rowland was picked up by the TPD on an assault charge early the next day, and although no one can really say what had happened except for the two involved, we can be pretty damn sure the headline and accompanying article that ran that afternoon was nothing more than race-baiting propaganda. The timeline moves pretty quick, so try and keep up. 3 p.m. The racist shitrag newspaper, the Tulsa Tribune, releases a call to action disguised as press, entitled, Nab Negro for Attacking Girl in an Elevator. It recounts Dick tearing Sarah's clothes, a complete fabrication. 4 p.m. Driven by the inflammatory article in their own ignorance, a crowd began to form around the courthouse downtown. 8.20 p.m. With the crowd now growing ever closer to a mob, three armed white men forced their way into the courthouse and demanded that the sheriff hand over Diamond Dick Rowland for an old-fashioned lynching. The sheriff, Willard M. McCullough, refused the men and ordered them out. The sheriff before him had handed over a black man to a lynch mob, and McCullough had ran against him and won by promising that something like that would never happen under his watch. 9 p.m. Word gets back to Greenwood about the situation at the courthouse. 25 black men, mostly World War I vets, get in their cars and drive straight there to help prevent the lynching. Upon their arrival, they march into the courthouse and offer their help in securing Roland, but Sheriff McCullough assured them that he wouldn't let anything happen. Aware of his particular stance on this item, they agreed to leave and let justice run its course. 9.15 p.m. The 25 black vets leave peacefully, passing through the crowd now swollen to a thousand plus whites. Seeing the armed vets, the crowd mistook their peacekeeping effort for a show of force, and remembered that they too owned guns. Some who didn't own guns remembered the National Guard Armory, but they forgot pretty quick when troops on guard threatened to shoot. 9.30 p.m. The crowd now engulfing the courthouse was 2,000 angry whites strong, with the thin gaps between them quickly being filled by more and more firearms. 9.50 p.m. Seeing the increasing firepower outside of his courthouse, Sheriff M. McCullough stepped outside and attempted to convince the crowd to disperse, but they refused. Wasting no time, he gave up on the lost cause and moved on to fortify his prisoner. He formed a defensive perimeter of deputies around Diamond Dick on the top floor of the courthouse. He put six of his men on the roof armed with rifles and shotties to boot. He disabled the elevators in the building and ordered his officers positioned at the top of the stairs to shoot on sight. Later, Tulsa Police Chief John A. Gustafson would claim to have assisted, 
but he never actually sent any substantial amount of his 64 officers to the scene, and he himself would be back in his own office at the station by 10.30 p.m. 10.10 p.m. A group of concerned black Greenwood citizens gather around the Tulsa Star, the largest black newspaper in Tulsa, debating what to do. A false rumor of armed whites charging the courthouse makes its way back to Greenwood. Not going to let a man be lynched. 75 armed black bets headed downtown, stopping at 6th and Main at the edge of the mob, where they march in a single file line straight to the sheriff's desk. They offer their help again, but for a second time it is refused. 10.30 p.m. The Black Bets were marching through the crowd towards their cars. It was at this moment that the universe aligned in just a way that a nobody dumbfuck racist could step in and change the course of history. And he would do so by ordering a black World War I vet to give him his rifle, his personal property. In proper Greenwood fashion, he told him to go fuck himself. But a struggle would ensue and an errant shot would ring out. And there was no stopping it now. When the accidental discharge struck the courthouse, the armed white mob and possibly the deputies fired on the outnumbered blacks who immediately returned their own volley of fire. In seconds, the gunfire was over, but 20 Tulsans, both black and white, lay on the ground, dead or dying, their blood indistinguishably filling the street with a single shade of red. Outnumbered 20 to one, the blacks took a retreat line towards Greenwood while being pursued by the vengeful mob 10.30 to 10.45 p.m. It was at this point that everyone, almost all at once, forgot about Roland and his diamond dick. Because the outnumbered vets were now in self-protection mode, while the whites were blinded by their racist rage and out for African blood. The military training of the black vets kicked in like PTSD on the 4th of July, and they began to take strategical positions to lay down cover fire for their brothers in arms along 4th Street. A deadlier trade of fire occurred at 2nd and Cincinnati, but the blacks would make it out and over the Frisco tracks. 10.45 p.m. Just down the street, at police headquarters on 2nd Street, Police Chief Gustafsson, still avoiding his duties, deputized a horde of 500 men and boys, most of whom were just a part of a lynch mob. After providing arms to as many as he could, he told the rest to get a gun and get a Although I confused Willard M. McCullough, the sheriff at the courthouse, with the white mob multiple times while reading through my notes, I think it's probably important that you don't. And here's why. During my research, I reviewed many sources, and a few of them completely threw him under the bus for this mass deputization. But the congressional report of the 1921 race riots commissioned by the state of Oklahoma in 1997 clearly stated that he was scrambling to keep Roland safe many blocks away. Where were we? The white mob started looting stores for guns and ammo. Some accounts claimed that cops assisted in this effort. 11 p.m. The Greenwood vets were able to hold the line at the Frisco tracks, which had proved a tactical advantage. Darkly poetic, the two sides of the tracks in Tulsa would become the very real opposing front lines of a war. Hundreds of men on both sides were firing across the tracks at each other until 1.30 a.m., with a passing conductor having to take cover on the floor of his train car as gunfire peppered and pierced his locomotive. With most of the black defenses busy holding the line at the tracks, parts of Greenwood were left unguarded Drive-bys began being reported in Greenwood with groups of cowardly whites firing indiscriminately into black homes. Thinking fast, the few black vets left in the neighborhood quickly took up sniping positions along the edges of Greenwood to keep their community safe from the invading horde. 1 a.m. The whites' invasion of Greenwood was being severely impeded by the well-placed snipers, who were steady picking off any threat to their community. In response, the white mob first set fires in Greenwood to smoke out the snipers and to reduce visibility, and it had worked, almost immediately clearing the enemies from the improvised sniper nests. And it was at this point that the momentum of Tulsa's forgotten war swung in favor of the vengeful. And although the sniper fire was no longer ripping through the streets of Tulsa and the roads to Greenwood were cleared, the fires only accelerated. 1.10 a.m. 
homes and businesses along Archer Street were the first to go up in flames. The responding fire crew was stopped from doing anything about it at gunpoint. Sporadic fires and violence flared up all over Greenwood throughout the night, but gradually slowed. 4 a.m. At least two dozen black homes and businesses had been completely torched. The air was still, and for a moment the citizens of Greenwood may have believed that the worst was over. Like wolfmen to the full moon, the Greenwood fires had beckoned the worst humans from all over the region to downtown Tulsa, totaling as many as 10,000, now with local National Guardsmen among the ranks. The lynch mob had metastasized into an unimaginable army of hate, and worse yet, it was becoming organized. This mass of menace split into three main brigades and several smaller companies and platoons. The two largest brigades formed two cancerous masses to the south of Greenwood just across the Frisco tracks. The last brigade assembled at Katy Passenger Station, west of Black Tulsa. The smaller militant companies and groups of local guardsmen took up more specialized preparations, like hauling a machine gun to the top of Middle State's Milling Company's grain elevator, which provided a straight shot down Greenwood Avenue. The guardsmen split into two groups and took position atop two hills along the west fringes of the black community. 5.08 a.m. A strange, echoing whistle was heard around the city that seemed to signal some sort of a charge. No one really knew where the whistle came from, because it was immediately drowned out by the sound of machine gun fire coming from the Middle State's granary and the rumble of a small army charging over the Frisco tracks by the thousands. This whistle marked the end of the Tulsa Race Riot and ushered in the Tulsa Race Massacre. The Katy Depot Brigade charged towards Greenwood by the thousands, mostly on foot, but several dozen vehicles joined in charging down Brady and Cameron. The black community fought valiantly to defend its piece of paradise, but it was the sheer number of the whites that would consume Greenwood. Thousands of fleeing black residents were pushed north by the blitzkrieg of whites from the track, and the machine gun fire zipping straight down Greenwood Avenue from the Grant Tower to the south. Those that peeled off early to the west to avoid the machine gun fire were met with the blinding sun and a surprise burst of 30 caliber gunfire from the local guardsmen atop Standpipe Hill. Incredibly, several guardsmen lost their lives in the immediate volley of blind return fire, speaking to the resilience of the Black Tulsans. Another collection of guardsmen sat atop Sunset Hill, just a couple blocks further north, who provided their own hail of standard issue 30 caliber fire towards their black countrymen further cutting off any westerly path of refuge. This outfit of guardsmen had been given a machine gun by the TPD to finish off anyone who had survived the gauntlet of gunfire, but it malfunctioned. Many of the victims that day preferred to go west into the gunfire simply because they could see what was coming to the east over the horizon was even more horrifying. At least six biplanes, piloted and packed with white men, armed to the teeth with high-power rifles and improvised bombs. It was the dynamite and nitroglycerin-laden parcels dropped from these planes that did most of the damage to the large structures in Greenwood. One of the most prosperous black communities in the entire country just 24 hours previous was now an active war zone. 5.30 a.m. A wave of white rioters descended upon Greenwood, breaking into homes and businesses. Anyone found inside was forced into the street and marched at gunpoint to Convention Hall. Those who opposed, or were found out guns in their homes, were being murdered in their own front yards. And still, some who complied entirely would meet the exact same fate, including A.C. Jackson, a doctor and surgeon renowned in his field. The accomplished African-American man of medicine was murdered in his front yard only a couple years after being endorsed by the Mayo Brothers, founders of the Mayo Clinic. Once the homes and businesses were cleared of the black residents, they were being looted for valuables and then set on fire using homemade torches and oil-soaked rags. Both the Tulsa police and a unit of uniformed white World War I vets helped in setting these blazes. The white mob moved through Greenwood, using this exact same formula, house by house, street by street, 
creating a wall of fire and destruction as they went. Before it was over, 36 city blocks would be burned to their foundation. The Black Tolsons put up at least one good stand to keep Standpipe Hill, where black riflemen took position in a church belfry nearby. Looking directly onto the basin of the hill, they were able to briefly fend off the white invasion. The white mob moved the machine gun from the granary tower down to the hillside where they filled the church with holes and set it ablaze. The Tulsa police and the local guardsmen started arresting blacks and asking whites to go home. Some white rioters even started arresting black people themselves. The wall and its mob of fire continued north, setting fire to over a thousand homes, a dozen churches, five hotels, 31 restaurants, eight doctor's offices, the black public library, and at least 24 grocery stores. The local guardsmen at Sunset Hill didn't see much action at first, but after a trade of fire to the north, they decided to join the white mob in assaulting a group of blacks that were held up in a store. The women and children of Greenwood largely fled into the woods before heading out of town. The blacks who had escaped the borders of Tulsa were not fully out of harm's way though, as members of smaller towns nearby joined in assaulting the exhausted refugees. 9.15 a.m. The state troop special train pulled into the blood-soaked Frisco station. These were actually the Oklahoma City-based National Guard unit requested the night before at 12.35 a.m. But because of the hard copy signatures needed for approval and the train needed to get on location, they would pull in 8 hours and 40 minutes later as the riot had pretty much run its course. While the Tulsa police and the local guard were ridiculed and shamed for their parts in the events, the state troops were largely praised for removing blacks from the custody of white citizens and keeping the peace. Although the leadership, General Barrett made sure they took their sweet ass time getting there to do it. After they broke ranks to eat breakfast in Tulsa, they meandered over to the courthouse where Barrett was unable to get a meeting with Sheriff McCullough. Barrett then ordered his men to patrol downtown and start going into the city to collect the falsely imprisoned blacks. These downtown patrols likely saved the few pieces of Greenwood that survived the event. 11.30 a.m. Martial law was declared. In accordance, all businesses had to be closed by 6 p.m. and by 7 p.m. only military and emergency response personnel were permitted to be out. Many businesses were shut down hours before the mandate bearing window signage inscribed <laughs> day. Most whites returned home, but some continued to loot. 12.30 p.m. The last bloodshed was at a two-story building near the Santa Fe tracks, where the blacks inside had held off their oppressors for hours. But as the potential threats to the whites dwindled, Resources were consolidated, and the high-power rifles that rained down on them from the planes hours earlier were now piercing through the building's facade just minutes before being set on fire. 1 p.m. Only after the issuing of martial law were the state troops allowed to move into Greenwood and clear the rioters and looters from the rubble that remained. Following the clearing of the ruins of Greenwood, Thousands were left homeless after fleeing into the woods and countryside, and hundreds more took refuge at Golden Gate Park. As more and more newly homeless blacks were detained, it became clear that Convention Hall would not be big enough for the kind of detainment camp that the Tulsa police needed, so they used the Tulsa Fairgrounds and McNulty Park, the local baseball field. The only way to be released was to have a white employer claim you as an essential employee and come get you out themselves. Many victims of the massacre were detained outside the fairgrounds through the winter months. Greenwood would never be the same. In the immediate hours following the tragedy, citizens made efforts to bury the fallen Tulsans, and before the sun had set on June 1st, there were already mass graves being dug around the city. This is no small task. Estimates of the dead start at 150 and go well over 300. There is no doubt that there are unmarked graves in Tulsa to this day, or that the officials in Tulsa at the time did everything they could to cover up their shameful racist slip-up while finding new ways to oppress Greenwood. Tulsa passed laws following the massacre that made it illegal to rebuild in Greenwood without using fireproof materials 
and the local sources hiked the prices and sometimes flat out refused to sell to the residents of Greenwood, making the rebuilding effort even tougher. As if that weren't enough, then Tulsa decided to build a major highway right through Greenwood, forever changing its landscape and splitting the community down the middle. On June 14th, Tulsa Mayor T.D. Evans was quoted saying, Let us immediately get outside the fact that everything is quiet in our city, that this menace has been fully conquered, and that we are going to go on in a normal condition. And while many Tulsans tried to pretend things were normal, there were a large number of white residents who looked upon the destruction of their racist neighbors in disgust. Many of them lied, saying that they were employers of the refugees, taking them into their own homes. The Red Cross moved in and helped in any way that it could, making homes and shelters from mere scraps. They remained in Tulsa assisting the refugees for months. It has been almost a hundred years since Greenwood was burned to the ground, but the community has spent the time slowly revitalizing and rebuilding, still proudly showing the character that made them so successful nearly a century ago. As someone who grew up less than a mile from Greenwood, I can tell you the scars are still visible today. And while it's true, efforts were made to cover up the events a hundred years ago, I think the media does its best to paint Tulsa today as some racist hotbed, and it couldn't be further from the truth. Although you don't have to go far outside the city limits to find some racists, for the most part, Tulsa is full of love, understanding, and respect for both their fellow Tulsans and the lessons learned in 1921. The city is currently spending a lot of money and effort to try and find the mass graves and bring a sense of closure to the victim's ancestors and to the city as a whole. Perhaps the victims could receive a proper burial, something the black community was forbidden from having in 1921. Starting with three sites marked for excavation, the first has already been processed with no human remains found. They will likely find a mass grave in one of the two remaining locations but there is always a chance that they won't find much of anything, which would coincide with the eyewitness reports of bodies being dumped in the Arkansas River. Some Tulsans who are in the know wonder why the Rock House, a local tourist attraction, which was a speakeasy in 1921, isn't on the search list. Several generations of proud Tulsans have been amending their kids' whitewashed Oklahoma history lessons with this awful oral history. And now the rest of the world has been slowly learning what Tulsa has always known. And it stings, doesn't it? But as time passes and we learn from our mistakes, wounds can heal. And tragedy can truly turn into triumph. But to me, death is not and death is not a fearful thing. It's living this treacherous. There's a big element of wanting complete control over someone. Remorse for what? You people have done everything in the world to me. Doesn't that give me equal right? Honey, honey. Ma'am, ma'am, I need to know the address. Four three one South East One. Hello.